Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. That was the good thing about the Montessori school. They're very accepting. So even though my English was pretty bad in the beginning, they accepted me and then they brought me in. That I'm attracted towards products or services or um, things that people do that are not without a blemish. I got introduced to the underwater world through scuba diving. And the philosophical part of me was just kind of angry, actually, that we know so goddamn little about this thing that's on our planet and we're trying to send people to Mars. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Fei Wu, and you're listening to the Face World Podcast. Today, I want to welcome Gordon Lau to Face World. Gordon recently graduated from NYU, which is New York University, with a degree in philosophy. Compared to a student philosopher, I find Gordon much easier to relate to and to describe as an athlete or as a musician and a master level scuba diver. Um, he received his certificate, I guess, when he was just 14 years old. And at age five, I took Gordon skating for the first time. He furiously got up after each fall and didn't want to leave for hours. I remember my mom and his mom were both stunned and I found courage and bravery just witnessing him learning something new. And at age 10, he won a ping pong tournament in Hong Kong. And he also played rugby for the Hong Kong national junior team. And what else? He's a skateboarder uh, still and he skateboards everywhere. Gordon and his family moved to Toronto when he was just three years old. He didn't speak any English and was enrolled in a Montessori school. And just before middle school, his family again moved back to Hong Kong and Gordon experienced major reverse cultural shock for the first time. He was then, without many options, um, had to enroll in the brutally competitive Hong Kong International School, HKIS, all the way through high school. I have known Gordon literally since the day he was born, and our families stayed close regardless of the distance. He spent a few summers with us, with my family, when I was still living in Beijing, but also after I moved to Boston. In Boston, I remember dropping him off, picking him up at MIT, you know, at several basketball camp, you name it. And he was maybe around 10 years old. Later on uh, in our interview, he described an experience of going to UC Berkeley for summer camp. I remember that was me who brought him over there. So throughout the years, uh, I have been really surprised to witness Gordon's transformation from just a little kid to an intelligent young man. He's very into fitness, so uh, I asked him to give away quite a few tips towards the end of the podcast. And he's also a flawlessly well-dressed person, so some fashion advice was inevitable as well. So what's the point of this interview? Beyond my own reflections for Gordon's upbringing and recent development, his story isn't so unusual for millennials today. I find that many children grow up in multiple continents as a result of their parents' jobs, choice of immigration, and I also often find these people to be really interesting to talk to, and not only because they were able to take pictures from around the world, but rather the amount of fears and struggles and self-actualizations they had experienced at such a young age. When you move around a lot as a kid, the loss of connections to friends can be really difficult. People who experience these transitions early on in life seem to be more calm and resourceful as they get older. These kids are also more likely to become entrepreneurs and doing their own things. Face World has tapped into an interesting theme about change. And I think all of us go through changes constantly. Very few of them are unnoticeable. Most of them are uncomfortable, even scary at times. You might ask yourself, is it really all that scary or are you just making yourself scared? You don't know the answer until you come through the other end. 
But meanwhile, my friend, I hope you know that you're not alone out there. And hearing other people's stories on Face World has painted a vivid picture for me to understand just that. So I hope you enjoy this conversation, this interview with Gordon. I, I feel very blessed to have him and his family in my life. Without further ado, please join me and welcome Gordon Lau to the Face World podcast. <laughs> I'm here with Gordon Lau, someone I've known for uh, his entire life and um, <laughs> for the past 22 years. You just turned 22, right? Yeah. Great. And then who is uh, very lucky to be a soon to be graduate from uh, NYU, New York University, majoring in philosophy and psychology. And you have a very interesting life, someone who grew up in Hong Kong for uh, a, a number of years, well, actually, until you were about three or four, and then moved to Canada and lived there till you were 10 or 11, attended interna international school, and now you're in the U.S. And so you've got quite a path. So how, how do you... How do you feel? I mean, do you ever think about the fact that you lived in so many places? And Being in Canada was... I mean, looking back, it's probably the most influential part of my life. Not because I got my citizenship and it's much easier to go to university in the U.S. because of that, but rather something simple is because of the Montessori school I went to there. I went there too. Mm -hmm. um, it was called TMS, Toronto Montessori School. And at the time, I didn't know what I was doing. Their system of education was very different from anything I've ever encountered. And that was my first grade. Um, so I thought education was going to be like that forever, where um, all the activities were set out on the side and every student was given a syllabus that they was specially created just for them. Mm -hmm. And they had to just cre uh, finish the test by the end of the week or month. Mm -hmm. And you just check in with the teacher every time um, you finish an activity, you get graded on it. Um, but secretly graded. I didn't know we actually had grades, which was the craziest part. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Surprise. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, I didn't know what to do because in Chinese culture, you basically just listen to the adult or whatever. You have to figure out, sounds like in, in Canada, you have to kind of figure out, were you given tasks and things to expectations to meet? Or you're saying that you kind of have this free range education? Um, there were tasks you had to do. So like there were grammar tasks, there were like math tasks mm -hmm. and you just chose what you wanted to do. And I didn't know we were being great. So I just did only the stuff that I really liked doing. So geography, I mean, as a kid, the activities were intriguing because you had to move pieces around. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing I'm trying to get at is when I moved back to Hong Kong, it, I didn't know how to analyze what was going on because I moved from Montessori school setting to a traditional um, school setting which is based off like the French industrialist um, classroom setting. So international, Hong Kong international school. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because to someone like myself who went to like a real local school and felt that was the many aspects, you know, my abilities were constrained and my, my own thinking was kind of... Uh, you know, in, in a way that expectation was set for me. There was nothing I could really set for myself uh, for or for anybody else. But, you know, by the time you came back, when you're at the age of 10 or 11, you felt in a way that, wow, this is, there's a lot of structure that was put in place, kind of very different. Um, yeah, I saw all these structures, all these systems of control. And then now, if I'm going to put some, like, words to it, it, it was... A reverse culture shock somehow. It's, I, when I went to Canada, it wasn't a shock to me because I had no experience of what schooling was like. Mm -hmm. So that became my norm. But then when I moved back to Hong Kong, I was confused because I didn't, at that point, I didn't know my Montessori school was that different. And mm -hmm. thinking back now, I would definitely send my kids to Montessori school for as long as possible. And I think that was a big part of my life now that I look back on it. And it didn't seem like that for years. I mean, only just two years ago did I really reflect and see Mm -hmm. how much of an impact it made on my life. So fundamentally, like fast forward now in your very early 20s, what are some of the 
recent events or thoughts or experiences you've had and that you reflect, reflect upon that, well, there really it could be, you know, someone or some experience uh, I had back in Canada. You know, whatever, it doesn't have to be super specific, but what are some of the things that you feel like you go through life reflecting upon your life in Canada? I don't know what drove me to philosophy, but partially it might be a disconnection I felt throughout my upbringing because I grew up in Hong Kong. I uh, grew up until like three years old or so. Mm-hmm. I learned a bit of Cantonese, a little bit of Mandarin, but then I was at a three year old level, um, mm-hmm. which isn't that good. It would have been fine if I had stayed there for the uh, rest of my life, but what happened was I moved to Canada, like you said, and there I had to learn English. I had no idea like how to speak it. Mm. Uh, when I got there, so I mean that was the good thing about the Montessori school. They're very accepting. So like, even though my English was pretty bad in the beginning, they accepted me and then they brought me in, mm. and that was really helpful. So the difference I'm trying to draw is when I went back to Hong Kong from Canada. The schools there, as I said, were more rigid, and they wanted to kick me down two grades in order to join their school. Oh, in Hong Kong, St. Paul's. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the disconnection. So like, it's about language, really, essentially. Um, you know, it's just like I noticed that you were absolutely passionate about philosophy, which is your major versus, you know, some you also notice some kids are like, I'm undecided. I don't know what to do exactly. And perhaps I will choose to major, in, you know, uh, marketing communication. Sometimes I hear the themes of philosophy and psychology as well, even though it's like there's a lot of work involved uh, at a place like NYU. Some kids may worry that I'm truly passionate about this, but what is it? What is a guarantee? What is the security? beyond graduation would you like to share some insights to you know what you you have learned what are some of the areas you've been exploring even though you know nothing may be certain or fully defined yet so yeah perfect example actually segueing into this what i was talking about before um how things will just suck you in that's what happened to me um that's how i can speak so not vividly about it but like from the heart because i originally went to nyu uh, as a psychology major, I declared it um, on my application. And I mean, you major, but after the first year or so, it's not that psychology is shallow, but it seemed like a sub part of philosophy. And when I started taking philosophy courses as a potential minor, I eventually started caring more about my work in philosophy. And then mm-hmm. at some point, I, I passed the point of no return where the <laughs> fatal mistake, as Rousseau would say, um, <laughs> fatal mistake, yeah. Uh, and I just completely embraced philosophy as my major. What time um, during your study did you switch over? The seed of doubt started even before I started applying for colleges, actually, because <laughs> everybody has like their philosophical start point. And then for me, it was either reading Nietzsche, which is a very stereotypical one. Um, but for me, I think looking back now, um, it was when I was at a summer camp in Berkeley, um, sophomore year of high school. Oh, yeah, and I was there. I brought you there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the very last day of the program, I handed in my essay. The professor, I think she was called Rhonda, she talked to me about my paper. The grammar was good. The syntax was okay. But then she asked me this one thing about the content, which was about uh, a statement I made in that paper, which was that, I don't remember what the paper was about, but what I said was, blah, 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 this is happening, but then at least this is adding to our progress, to society's progress, and then professor asked me what what do you mean by progress and at that point i didn't really uh think about stuff like that so i was just like wait are you saying i used the wrong word like Mm -hmm. do you mean i should have used advancement or something but no she was talking more philosophically um she was saying that making claims like yeah we're we're making progress it's it's a truism and truism so it's just basically nothing statements because like what progress is in like every second is passing and then that that's progress to progression of time Mm -hmm. and then she's not she wasn't even just pointing at like the potential ambiguousness of the difference between passage of time as progression or like progress as most laymen might think of it like oh things are getting better um she was talking more about Relativity. I mean, I haven't really thought of the best word for it, but relativity is it. I think 
that, you know, this, I think I know exactly what you mean by that. I think progress is for, as you know, for my upbringing, especially the first secondary education that I had up till 10th, 11th grade, you know, we, we keep talking about the result. The result being your grade, the result being whether you received an award or not, or some sort of indication, oftentimes external, not internal validation, but external validation. So I'm a huge fan of this um, this psychologist, or actually I don't know her exact title, um, Carol Dweck talks about the education system in uh, some parts of Europe to say that they have two grades. One grade, instead of fail, it says not yet. She thought it was magical. You know, it was saying you haven't arrived yet. You haven't, you haven't gotten there yet, but you will. Is that indication of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset? It's really quite um, amazing that for you to be exposed to the level of thinking at the age of what at the time 15, 16, which I had no access to that at all. And thinking about like if someone were to express that idea to me, it, it could have changed my life you know, earlier on too. So I don't know whether that's, you know, piggybacking on, onto what you were talking about or potentially philosophically much deeper is uh, where you're trying to convey. Yeah, I uh, actually remember some parts of it now. So she was wary of the idea of saying like, we're making progress on our goal of getting to somewhere. And then what is this somewhere? And like, the basic question was, what the fuck do you mean by progress? Like, Yeah, you're okay to swear here, yeah. so get carried away. It's just like throwing words around that people will, like, will validate. It's like, oh, I know that we're progress. Yeah, sure. Like, yeah, we are making progress. It's a bunch of these nothing words, really. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think that that sense of, uh, you know, in a way that it's like false urgency and... Um, you know, this arbitrary checklist, right? That doesn't quite go away when you are um, in your late 20s and for me, early 30s. I feel like when you were a kid, that whole idea of progress is almost magnified to a degree that, you know, grade by grade, right? Or which grade are you in? Which semester of the grade you're in? Versus like how many people truly care about what year, how many years I've been working, right? So now I'm personally being measured every five years as somebody who has, I have 10 years of work experience, just a little bit different than the five years of experience. And then beyond that, think about it, like 20 25 versus 30 years of experience, nobody cares. So I think it's really interesting that the indication of where we are in life changes. And then there comes to, have you gotten married yet? You know, have you had kids? How many kids have you had? Is it too few or too many? Is it, um, but to kind of, you know, I, I want to kind of jump around a little bit because we, I think we can talk about philosophy for a very long time. But I do want to also give people grounded advice and some some of the experience that you, you've led up to this point. You know, what people haven't heard about you is that you're a very well-rounded, very thoughtful person in terms of, you know, your experience in, in sports. You know, you played rugby on a very competitive team. You're very good at ping pong, you know. Being good at ping pong in, in China, not just not just anywhere in the world, okay? And and in your experience of music, you started a band, you're interested in art, and you're a, a master diver, and which part of, like, or maybe all of that really matter to who you are today? Or do you think anything I've mentioned just now kind of jumps out to say, wow, that really gave me a much unique and unexpected experience? Okay, so two things. So, like, for some self validation here, I'd I'd say all of those things that you mentioned, especially scuba diving and philosophy, I would suggest that anybody try it. Like, those two things have been such an integral part of my life. Um, scuba diving. Yeah, scuba diving and philosophy are related. I think it just mm-hmm. in the very same world. You just go down a few meters in the water, and you're already in a different world. I mean, not to speak so figuratively, but. That's what it feels like. Um, but the other thing is, you speak of me highly, and I I appreciate it. It makes me feel better. Um, but the thing is, I'm not so sure what to say about um, confidence and also the breakdown in confidence and what you get from the breakdown in confidence that you once had before. So, like, what I do value a lot right now is how in college or, like, the end of high school, and even especially right now, actually, um, seeing all these other people who are 
better than you in specific things or you, you might even think that they're better than you in general mm-hmm. like a lot of people probably have this feeling um and that gave me a new perspective on life i mean i was a typical teenager thinking that i knew everything and like i had answers that were unmovable um but as i'm getting a slightly older now <laughs> as a 22 year old saying that's funny but okay so to begin with, the breakdown of confidence, you start to learn lessons like, oh, okay, maybe I shouldn't make such absolute statements all the time, or like I shouldn't um, always act as if everybody should care about what I do. Mm-hmm. Those are very important lessons, but at the same time, the breakdown of confidence can be very trapping. I mean, it's so funny. I started to realize this about myself, I'm kind of uh, retrospectively, that just like what we talked about five minutes ago of how we're now measured differently. You know, there's a cutoff almost when you're 21, 22, you bounce from a school that you could be proud of, like Ivy League or something. You you are then dropped into the real world. And all of a sudden, what do people use to measure you as a person? Traditionally, in the Asian society, how much money do you make? Right. And I've heard many parents lie about their, their kid's salary almost constantly when I was growing up. And then, you know, secondly, which company? Do you, and then, so what does that mean, you know? Okay, yeah. Um, so. For me, this breakdown of confidence, it's more internal than not. And I see I see that my life needs to be seen through others for me to experience, like, the human animal experience. But, like, my sense of value, I think it's separate from that. I mean, not so. just try to sound like a badass, but, like, if people say shit to me, like, and they say shit about me, it's just, it sucks because I'm, I'm an animal. And then, like, invalidation is painful because it's just trained into you evolutionarily but like beyond that it means nothing to me besides passing memories of like the pain that was inflicted at the moment it was said so okay so let's break that down a little bit more because that's that's certainly a conflict internal or external that many of us are living living with still regardless of the age you know um so even even for me you know working at an agency where you know, I question, do I fit into the culture socially? What I mean, you know, you know me, I don't drink, I don't really party all that much, but what if that's what everybody else cares about? You know, that social pressure when you go to work the next day. I mean, literally, you're no longer part of that circle, a conversation. You have no idea what happened the night before. It's interesting. I, I thought about how, you know, how much it used to impact me to towards the end, how little that impacted me, that I decided to use, utilize my time to do other things I truly enjoy that I, I felt liberated, that I no longer have to fit in. Because I think it breaks down to the people that you're listening to. I mean, it's not a good or bad difference, but there's a difference between what you said and what I said, because the way you said it was, it, it seems, uh, I don't know, I'm going to ask you, like, the, are you implying that you still do care about what other people think, but then, like, you know that it's more better for you to do what you want to do instead of going out? It's not that I don't care about any of that at all, and I still certainly sense some of that, but it's about 5 to 10% of the intensity that you should <laughs> okay. experience. So there's growth and progress there, by the way, but... You know, at the same time... Right, exactly, the growth and progress, again. Like, you know, the thing is, like, maybe 50 years from now, like, that's not so much progress then. Because maybe 50 mm-hmm. years from now, you're like, oh, maybe I should have gone to those clubs or... Everything's somewhat arbitrary and relative. Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know, looking at the uh, my podcast as an example, when I first recorded, when I recorded the first episode and then... After that was done, they recorded the intro. Just the level of an anxiety was something I kept talking about on my podcast. And at some point, people were like, you need to get used to it at this point. I mean, you released 10, 20 episodes. When are you ever going to overcome that fear? I think, actually, that's what I would like for you to not keep in your podcast. But, like, that's what I would say separates it from, like, the masses out there um, of all the other podcasts. Because I really dislike it when people, like, get into the flow of things. I know I'm not saying that because I want people to fail, but like when you get into the flow of things, it's not so much you because then like a lot of the times you're just being pushed forward or patterned by something that you're not really conscious of. Yeah. So like when I see people, I mean, it's a psychological fact. It's just when you see people struggle, you can connect with them more. I really don't want some kind of um, hipster bullshit, some guy on NPR saying like, yeah, I know everything, so I'm just going to bring people on here because I'm the person who knows everything. I know how to talk people best. And like, that's why I never stutter. But like, everybody goddamn stutters at home 
mm-hmm. or with their friends or with their family. And then that's what we want. Like, we don't want the packaged McDonald's. We want the mom and pop, like, burger that might have, like, mm. and that is a bit undercooked, a little bit too oily. This is just the battle between what's authentic and what's not authentic. And even that can be questioned. But say, I'm just going to express my instinct right now, which, which is that I'm attracted towards products or services or um, things that people do that are not without a blemish. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I kind of like this vulnerability. That's why people like, uh, you know, the, the book Power of uh, Vulnerability is incredibly popular. Uh, and I think it's really well said that when there is that sea of, uh, sea of sameness, whether it's people or behaviors or clothing or, you know, anything that we do or food, you know, you start to, I noticed that people started to steer away from that quite some time ago, but to come out and say that that is not what I want and this is what I want. And I feel like that has been a phenomenon that I've witnessed in the past, especially like three to five years, it in itself, it intensified, you know, and I, that's why since you're visiting Boston, I, I got really excited of talking to people through your generation as I saw the sneak peek of that when I was graduating 10 years ago. But to see that, wow, it's, it's true that people are going after, you know, smaller companies and going into, you know, uh, underprivileged uh, neighborhoods to really help people out, to get their hands dirty. There are many, many, many graduates even before you are no longer saying, I'm staying in New York City because it's hip and cool and I'm going to work for these Fortune 100 companies. I mean, as I'm still young, I have a really love-hate relationship with a lot of things because so much energy in me that it might come out as passion, but like it's just opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of helping people and like doing these other things, um, if you're actually helping people, great for you. Like, I'm not going to say like it's the way you should spend your life because that's up to you to decide. But if you're just a tourist, I mean, I'm going to like shit on HKS a little bit here. Like we had these interim trips and you could either choose an adventure one or you can choose a service one. Thing is like people look down on the ones who chose the adventure ones because like, why, why didn't you choose the service one? Because you'd be helping other people. But things, I went on a few of those and it's just a lot of back padding. Like, oh, we're building this volleyball court for like the school and then we finished half of it and we were there for a week. Like we should have finished it. Mm. But then the thing is like we're a bunch of tourists, so like we helped out for a few hours and then like pat ourselves on the back, go into those classes, teach them ABCs as if it's gonna like benefit them the, that much. And like that's why I just like the tourist version of social work. Mm-hmm. So and what? that dilutes the value that or supposed value that people who actually do want to help people and do help people like put out in the world. What are some of the observations and experience that you look at, whether it's from yourself that you experienced right then and there, or somebody else, family or friend, that you look at and say, wow, that that's meaningful impact. That's There's a meaningful measure against it. The idea is just whatever it pain, whatever pains you and you're not doing it, that's, that's probably what drives you and that's probably what you should pursue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we met with uh, Andy uh, Atherton, and soon you'll be meeting his uh, twin brother, um, Kevin from Cirque du Soleil, uh, during our Paramore show on Broadway. One of the things that Andy said that this just stayed with me since I connected with them was the fact that they're moving to New York and everything inside themselves are telling them, look, we maybe we should just mm-hmm. settle, okay. maybe. And they did it. And I think that's a great example of pursuing something that that pains them, that they, they're they scared of. That's another description. Pursue something that really scares you. And there's a saying of, like, do something that's, that scares you every single day, and you continue to grow. There's this philosophical point, I forget who it's from, but it's just, he said that life is just a long journey of finding out what you want to kill you. So, like, you find what you love and let it kill you. Mm-hmm. So, like, I mean, not let it kill you as in, like, oh, I like trapeze, like, um, art, so I'm going to just... Do it, do it over concrete with no net. No, I think the gist of it is just let it consume you. I mean, yeah, this, this is a problem though, because as I said before, um, with the vulnerability thing, like when you go into auto drive, it's, it's dangerous. But then right now I'm saying that you should find something that makes you want to be put into autopilot for it. Again, from the beginning, as I said, it's to each their own and 
just look closer and see whether it's autopilot that's put on by somebody else or external factors or if you willingly uh, flip the switch Mm -hmm. yourself. I mean, I think when you say it's interesting that sometimes I have these conversations on my podcast and there's something very definitive. There are a quick action items as in giveaways to say, try doing this today, right? But I think what you're offering is also definitive in a way that it's about uh, asking or inviting people to think differently. I wish I had more opportunities in school, not just in college, but also in secondary schools that someone teach me how to think, how to approach certain situations, especially, especially not necessarily the terrible ones, but when things don't go your way. And as simple as something I learned most recently, uh, Josh Waitzkin on Tim Ferriss' podcast about how Josh is now a parent, a father, and, uh, and he talks about whenever there's a snowstorm, um, storms of any kind, most parents say, stay in house, we're not going to go anywhere, we're pissed. But instead, he would take his young boy, less than four years old, to dance in the rain. So I want, um, you know, in a way, if, I, if I'm a teacher or in a way that I'm teaching little kids, as you know, my Taekwondo school, I invite people to kind of experience, address the pain, don't ignore it, you know, don't. Don't pretend that it doesn't exist to experience, but still be able to function, you know. And how many times, uh, you know, do you recall that your something happened in your life, big or small? You know, that's that's painful at varying, uh, you know, scales and degrees. And then that you just don't feel like yourself. You might slow things down. Or for some people, it, it, it really impacts their lives for an extended period of time that they're not being themselves they're not productive. So I wish there are, you know, there are ways that are kind of built into our mechanism, um, you know, and then since we're a young child to be able to handle that, I think that will be really powerful. Yeah. Um, there's definitely value in that, but at the same time though, being able to just brush anything off, brush things off with rapidity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to go into the, the obvious consumerism uh, analogy but it's just when you can brush things off or like take the hits become less human it's kind of like dating a lot of people and then actually becoming infatuated with them but then Mm -hmm. uh, being able to brush them off really fast i think that's a sign of uh much insecurity you know it's when people are really shielded up to say that i really i can't i don't want to fall in love with anybody and you know you know like people say love is a bitch it's that when you lose yourself you know you lose your some of your senses it's it's in a way that you know just like find your you know what's the difference between passion and, and opinion once you find something that truly feel passionate about it's to me it's scary like you know it's like finding podcasting is so much fun to be able to connect with people on such a deep level but anything at that level also comes with a, a great amount of responsibilities you know just like you said you know, you fall in love with something, then you have to be, you have to be responsible for you know that downstream impact. So let's let's talk about something that uh, to close on this. Last night we started talking about ocean studies. What's the right word for uh, that domain? I think that's the thing because there hasn't been much activity in that sector really. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's no like household term for it or like. Even right now, like when I'm thinking about it, all I can think about is just oceanography or like ocean surveying. And that's the issue because it's just not in the conversation right now. So that interests you. Could you, do you mind repeating and just tell our audience a little bit about what's involved, what you're interested in? Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole scuba diving plus philosophy thing is, would pretty much sum it up because I got introduced Mm -hmm. to the underwater world through scuba diving. And the philosophical part of me was just kind of angry actually that we know so goddamn little about this thing that's on our planet and we're trying to send people to mars it's actually easier to go to mars because there's no pressure out there it's much less so like going down and in, uh deep into the ocean that's when materials really really get tested and that's what's really hindering development in that area so i mean i can't really be that angry but like at, at least i'm annoyed that we know less than like I think the last estimate was like 5% of the ocean or something. I'm not exactly sure. It's something really low. Yeah. 
if you could be anything in that industry, what what are some of the things that you you would consider doing? Oh, actually, though I do want to be part of the whole big picture planning of that kind of stuff, I do also really, really desire um, to be the person on the ground. Well, in this case, in the water, mm-hmm. um, in the contraption going down deep, uh, do, dealing with whatever, or doing the tech diving uh, involved. I mean, and that's actually a point um, that might invalidate everything that I said before about not just doing things and getting into the flow of things. Because for the people like me who's listening to this podcast, like you, you might be nodding, you at risk of invalidating everything I've said before. Like just advice for those people, which I've found becoming more and more relevant is just whenever I actually just do something, and usually it just pertains to like music or like more conversational things like mm-hmm. interacting with humans just get your head out of your ass and stop thinking about the details stop thinking about like what the smartest thing to say in a conversation is i mean this podcast is a great example of it because i haven't in- been interviewed before so in the beginning of this interview i was trying to say some smart shit but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, exactly so case in point really i mean the review or a summary of this interview is nothing said here is true nor false. <laughs> it's just you, you take what's going to be useful for you and then like, like let's say you're an asshole and you succeed, you're going to rationalize everything that you did saying that like, oh, that's how I'm yeah. successful now because all those things I did because that was me. Whether or not whether you're an asshole or not, you're going to rationalize your story, you're going to create your narrative. So that's something that's completely out of my control. I can't even fathom what kind of narratives you guys might come up with, but... Which is kind of the, the point of a yeah. lot of people. Again, this is not specific to face world, but, you know, young men and women are, are coming out and saying, you know what, I have a microphone, I'm going to record this conversation. And not to validate anything, but just simply mm-hmm. to share. No, it's great. Yeah. You know, I mean, what I said wasn't saying, I, I didn't mean like this podcast is you trying to be smart or anything. No, no. Oh, no, I know. I'm understand. saying like the experience of the people who might be being interviewed for the first time on your podcast. Mm-hmm. It's I'm expressing my feeling of it like literally, right, as I speak right now. So throughout this whole podcast, I try to like show value, demonstrate value or whatever. Yeah, but then, then you, you kind of get in your own way, right? So, that, so let's talk about a quick few hits, just quick Q&As and you can provide shorter answers. So if you're super into fitness and you constantly grab protein shakes or snacks on, on the go. So what are your go-to snacks and or pr- protein drinks? In the beginning, go for the protein shakes and stuff. Sure, that will help you. But in the end, if you want to develop a better discipline of fitness, it does help to force yourself to eat natural foods. So like get your protein from meats and like vegetables if you want. Because it, it's not just because like, oh, that stuff, that vitamin or protein you're getting from meat is better than whey protein. That's truly not the case, like a lot of the times. Yeah. But rather what it gives you is this regiment of oh go to the supermarket choose out which food you want and then like through the process of doing those things you develop a habit and like an intellect about what it is to be healthy or fit like according to you so like when you go choose your meat you're like okay in the middle of that steak there's a bit too much fat so i'm gonna go for the skinnier one and then over time you're just gonna build that into yourself i mean i also disagree with that kind of like venture because it can make you a robot if like all you do is eat uh, grilled breast, like chicken breast, mm-hmm. and then uh, broccoli. That's yeah. that's gonna mess with you. Oh yeah, and also, more, more importantly, is people should stray more away from the whole. Oh, I'm in college and there's a gym here. Let me get huge. Let me get into like the whole bodybuilding thing. I mean, it's attractive in the beginning. I mean, mm-hmm. physically you're gonna look better, and also like you're gonna feel better. But there are way better options out there, such as more natural like movements. Like the most mainstream one I can think of is yoga, but then you can move on to like Ido Portal or Move Nat. Mm-hmm. I'm not being paid by those two people. I just really think that th- that's the next step for human fitness, at least. Yeah, from my no, I'm going to include these resources <laughs> on the, on the yeah. blog post. So no, I know you're very into that. Um, okay, so I'm not sure how into fashion you are these days. Your mom is, you know, one of my <laughs> big heroes here. What are some of the, um, where, where do you shop these days? What are some of the, the, your, what's your current style? I don't have a specific store, but my buy policy is, will it last me more than five years? And like, am I only getting this because of a trend that's happening this month, this week, this year? Mm-hmm. And that's not a reason to not like get the item, but like, understand it and if you understand it and you still want it then 
get it. Maybe maybe have that be a, like a slightly smaller percentage of your closet. You know, yeah. some people are like, oh, I'm 80, 90 percent mm-hmm. the trends. Like more simply speaking, just get more basics mm-hmm. and get some nice jackets. And then I think you're set. You can mix and match. Mm-hmm. No need to. Because then the thing is, like, if you're worried about people recognizing that thing, the thing that you're wearing has been worn, like, recently, however, like, whatever recently means to you, people don't really get interested by basics. So, like, they're not going to remember. Yeah. Like, oh, that black shit. I saw you wear that yesterday or half a year ago. Why are you wearing it again? Like, I'm just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm all about minimizing things. Um, three more questions. What are... What are some of the books you're reading currently or or books that have uh, much impact on you? Uh, Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. That's a must read for me, really. Michel Le Foucault's um, Truth Games. I forget which book it's from, but that, that one was really not eye-opening, but the way he presents it is done very well. Mm-hmm. Great. Currently, the current people you're, you're following were news channels that you're following. Oh, oh man, yeah. Um, just for general news, um, I don't think you can really beat the aggregator of Google News. It's just you get a piece of everything. So, like, let's just say you do like a certain very esoteric uh, news source, like Christian Science Monitor. Mm-hmm. Um, it will be on uh, Google News as well. Mm, interesting. So, like, you will be exposed to a lot of different perspectives on the very same issue and. There's value in that. Oh, and in terms of video news, one really suggested to those fan of heart, Live Leak. That really opened my eyes up. Live for, Leak? Yeah, I don't know if you should really suggest this to any of your uh, readers if they can't stomach it, because it's some of the stuff on there. It's really graphic, and that's why it's eye-opening, because it's the news that was decided to be unpalatable mm-hmm. for um, the normal news. Got it. So I'm sure it will attract a lot of people. <laughs> what attracts most, uh, what's most attractive about philosophy to you? Because apparently there are many aspects of mm-hmm. that I didn't know about. Um, as I mentioned before, what it really drove me to do it was that I was in psychology class um, and I was just unsatisfied. Mm-hmm. Um, it was everything the professor said. I was just like, well, it's in a bigger set of like, there's bigger context to it than like you're providing and not to be, it's not to be snobby or anything, but it's just that it seemed like I was missing out mm-hmm. on what psychology was trying to get at. I mean, it's weird because things branch out of philosophy to get at other things, but at the same time, like when they when these branches try to reference the trunk it came from, it's weird. There's almost it's almost as if the limb is like floating, detached from the trunk, uh, because they really don't want to admit that it came from it. It's what I enjoy the most, and it's also what I think is the most contentious and the most, it's funny, the most valueless of, of values. So what, who are some of the philosophers that uh, you find most inspiring, <laughs> living or dead? <laughs> it's obviously Nietzsche for me, but I'm also trying to like deviate from that because Nietzsche means so much to so many people. Um, a, a lesser known one, Schopenhauer. Um, and Nietzsche uh, learned from, well, not learned from him, but says that he learned a lot from Schopenhauer, but eventually Nietzsche shits on Schopenhauer. But I think his stuff is a little bit more nihilistic in a good way for some people. Some people think that Nietzsche was wrong in criticizing Schopenhauer. Um, so I think those who do like read Nietzsche, which I know is a lot of people who are like even just barely interested in philosophy even mm-hmm. i even got my mom to read a chinese version of mm-hmm. uh, nietzsche's the speak zarathustra so if you are interested in like nietzsche i think you should read a bit schopenhauer and see how you feel if somebody wants let's just trigger another question if somebody want to get into philosophy maybe for the first time mm-hmm. you know um, what are some of the beginner's book or i wouldn't go from there i would go from think about what it is that drove you to like potentially think about philosophy and then find a paper on that Mm -hmm. so like let's say you got into philosophy because you think that there's some hypocrisy in saying that animal lives matter and then there's these mass slaughterhouses and then you can go look into the nature of values so like you can look up a paper on morality so like if you think that morality isn't really real i would read john Mackey's error theory that one's pretty good um so start with the issues you're interested with not don't go with the intro to philosophy books because that will uh, oh, boy, you boy, did death. Death. Really? <laughs> we almost said it the same <laughs> yeah. So, la- last question. Um, 
it doesn't have to be meaningful for the next 20 years, but what is your, uh, what is your outlook and view on living a meaningful and fulfilling life? What does that mean to you? I don't know so much that you can live a meaningful life, but fulfilling life is more pr probable because fulfilling you could. I mean, fulfilling can be like done through physical means, and that's like much easier. Mm -hmm. And I, that's the thing about being somewhat of a nihilist. Um, don't believe in meaning, really. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't stop me from like doing things as if I think they have like value. This is the human thing. Um, I'm an animal. I'm, I'm going to actually go desire things. But I don't think that's, you can't aptly say that's meaning, like mm -hmm. to better achieve what you desire as a human animal. Mm -hmm. So there's one question I personally dislike when, when I was thrown around on a podcast is, uh, you know, what's the, who comes to mind when you hear the word successful? Right now, the easiest example I can give is Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. um, too easy of an example because... A high he just, one. yeah, he just dreams up these things and goes and somehow does it. And he doesn't come, I mean, he wasn't like poor. He came from a decently well-off family. And then, I don't know, I usually don't look up to people. And he's like one of the only people I do look up to. Maybe that's a figment of my imagination. I'm creating some kind of person that doesn't exist in my mind, which is very likely. But looking like at this Looking at the empirical facts, it's just mm -hmm. amazing yeah, he's, person. He's quite, he's, he's quite just, out there. Yeah. Yeah. And then not just dreaming up these solutions, but actually transforming into reality. Yeah. You know, a physical product people can actually use and, and make their lives better. So thank you so much for being on Phase World. This is quite an intense yeah. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at Face World. Until next time, thanks for listening.